In this episode, we're going to do a deep dive into the questions you need to ask your building inspector, and you're going to learn about common building faults, what should be a deal breaker compared to what is normal to see in a building uh, report, pests, termites, and what to be aware of there. And lastly, a bit of lipstick on a pig. That is the sorts of things that people can put on a property to cover up a building fault that you should be aware of. Welcome to Your First Home Buyer Guide, the podcast for first home buyers who want to get it right. I'm Megan and that was Veronica. We're both buyers agents and probably old enough to be your mums. But that's a good thing because between us, we've got over 40 years experience and we are going to share with you bucket loads of stories about avoidable mistakes. Together, we're going to make sure that you get unbiased and real information that you can rely on so you can get where you want to be without missing a step. Now, we've got loads of great tips for you in this episode. And if you'd like more useful tools, head over to the website, homebuyeracademy.com.au. There you'll find free checklists that you can download, a free mini course on how to price a property and our where to buy workshop for only $39. Priceless stuff, really. Bargain. But before we get into the interesting stuff in this week's episode, here's the boring bit, the disclaimer. You of course know that nothing in this podcast is to be taken as personal advice. We always recommend getting the advice of an expert in their field of expertise. Now we've done our very best to ensure that the content is correct at the time of recording, but things change. So check with the relevant government authority or your advisors to get the most up-to-date information. Today, we're talking about how to get the most out of your building inspector by knowing the right questions to ask. And to help us in this quest, we're joined by a veteran of the industry, if you don't mind me saying so. Peter Mazia is a retired building and pest inspector, amongst other things, and was my inspector of choice when I began my, you know, my career, my journey as a buyer's agent. Now, builder is a, sorry, Peter is a builder by trade, a licensed real estate agent himself. He's been a radio show guest expert uh, on the ABC for, what, 13 years straight you were doing that for. Um, amongst other things, he does design buildings and renovates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's come out of retirement or semi-retirement today to help us, and we're so thankful that you have, Peter. And for an hour or so, you're going to share your experience and knowledge with us and you, the listeners. Oh, I'm so excited, Peter. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for joining Hi, us. Hello. I have spent about 20 years following building and pest inspectors around, um, you know, and there are so many questions that, that, that I love to ask and I love learning every single time I go to a building and pest inspection. But let's start at the beginning. Why should a buyer get a building inspection? Well, look, <laughs> it's a big risk if you don't. I mean, the building inspector mm. usually, in fact, not usually, always now by by law has uh, PI insurance. So it, you know, he's covered for any mistakes he might make. But really, uh, when you're looking for, when people are selling properties, they tart them up, they make them look nice, uh, you know, they style them and all of that. <laughs> and, and when you're looking for a property, you fall in love with it, you, you're emotionally connected, but the building inspector isn't. He's um, more objective and he can look at it and he can see through that type of styling, that type of presentation, and he can tell you if the property's you know, better than it looks or worse than it looks or as good as it looks. Well, that's the main, that's, that's probably the main thing. But also, um, usually with a, a building inspection, there's, there's a pest element too. And because termites are a big problem in Australia, um, mm. you'd be crazy not to get a building and pest inspection I, on anything imagine, but a concrete bunker. <laughs> imagine, Peter, you know, I, we, we follow building inspectors around all the time, but I still would never personally buy a property without having a building and pest inspection. And certainly for people who haven't a lot of experience in looking in, in, in uh, a property, there are a lot of things that you see that the average person wouldn't see, aren't there? Like, you know, I can look at a wall, but you might see something completely different to what I actually see. Of course. And um, also building consultants have some technology that helps them find things like dampness. Mm. They've got equipment that does that. But um, Oh, they're um, so cool, those, those moisture readers. They're, they're, yeah. they're sensational. Some of, them, some of them beep as you're going around and it scares the estate agents that are they're walking <laughs> around 
they can see the red light going and the thing beeping. That isn't always a horrible thing. But, not always. Um, it's not like a metal, de- metal detector. <laughs> no, no, that's, no, no, of course. Good thing. <laughs> that's, that's right. The one so I what? find really, really, sorry, Veronica, the oh. one I find really interesting in terms of the technology that you use, and, and we'll probably go into this in a great deal of depth shortly, is is that that heat um Tell us about that, the thermal heat, thermal, yes, thermal, thermal imaging. Thermal imaging cameras yes. uh, they're used to, um, to find those. live termites. They pick up the, the body heat of the termites. Um, also stethoscopes, funnily enough. Uh, so, and for example, if you have a really serious termite infestation, you can hear them. They, yeah. um, mm. they, they click away, they knock their heads together and, and, um, and hopefully you don't disturb them too much because then they might, well, disappear and, and um, you don't want your termites to go away. Once you know they're there, mm. you want to treat them. You don't want to scare them away because they could come back somewhere else, you know. We might come back to that because that's such mm. a big topic and so relevant. Veronica, that's we were going down a path before we <laughs> interrupted you. <laughs> don't worry. I've forgotten that path. But the, <laughs> I, le- I learned so much from, fo- you know, joining Peter at the end of building inspector, uh, inspections and so he'd be explaining and pointing things out to me and and that uh, that has been invaluable for me. And uh, certainly, you know, that whole idea of it, is the building as good as it looks or is it better mm. than it looks or is it worse than it looks is such a really good question for buyers to ask their inspector. And the other question that I think is a great one to ask is how does this one compare to others of a similar age and and a similar style? Absolutely. And certainly, you know, Peter, that every building is susceptible or every building style is susceptible to different types of faults, correct? Yes, absolutely correct. And and, and no building, look, there wouldn't be too many buildings that don't have some kind of defect. Mm. You know, you can't expect a building to be perfect. Buildings, you know, Even buildings, brand new, hey? Well, buildings start to get worse from the minute they're built. And, <laughs> and you've got to do stuff for their whole life to keep them in good nick. You know, you've got to, you've got to do maintenance and you've got to repair things as they crop up and what have you. And, and some buildings are built, built very badly right from the outset. Most not. Most are pretty good. Um, but um, if they're neglected, stuff happens. And so um, hopefully when you're buying one of these at, along its life somewhere, the, the building consultant will let you know what stuff has happened and what you need to do and what you need to expect down the track as well. Mm. I think mm. that's really important too because, you know, people just think, oh, but is it good or is it bad? It's like, well, actually, have the owners been good or bad? Have they been well-behaved or poorly yeah. behaved? Because, you know, a lot of people say to me, they say, oh, I don't want to buy a strata because I don't want to pay levies. And I'm saying, well, if you own a house, you need to maintain that. And mm. that is simply your own levies on that property. And so, you know, there's value in having a building that's well-maintained versus one that looks good but you know, has been tarted up and you did t- yeah. touch on that a bit earlier. Mm. So what are some of the things that say in a, yeah. say, let's look at brick and weatherboard, right? Just, just yeah. to be sort of, because there's a, usually typically you've got brick homes or weatherboard yeah. homes, right? So in a weatherboard home, what are some of the things that somebody, you know, if they haven't been maintaining that building, what's going to show up? Sure. Well, look, first of all, you, you, you started with uh, the different building styles and within that, you know, brick and weatherboard, there are many styles in the hmm. in the weatherboard styles. You've got weatherboards built in early 1900 and sometimes before in the inner city of Sydney stuff, you know, weatherboard buildings, 1860, 1870, not unusual. Uh, Very then common you've got in Brisbane too. Yeah. Oh, hmm. you've got some beautiful weatherboards in, yeah. in Brisbane. Love them. But um, it's actually one of my favourite types of house, the weatherboard house. Oh, it's lovely they for have Australia. so beautiful. much character, don't they? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you've got weatherboards built in the 50s and, and even modern weatherboards that mightn't actually be timber. They might be fibre cement weatherboards. So, But the most common thing you see in, in your older weatherboard house is fungal decay in the timber if, it's, if it hasn't been looked after. And, um, yeah, that's the most common thing. People might think that uh, weatherboard buildings are more susceptible to termites than other buildings, but they're not really. Um, The most susceptible building or the type of building that's most susceptible to termites is the brick veneer um, built on a concrete slab. So, you know, some buildings are on slabs. There's a myth that's been dispelled. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Why? Because um, a brick veneer building on a concrete slab uh, built, say, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, not so much lately, in, in more modern times, um, there are better protections built into them. You have to expose the slab edge and a few other things, little technicalities. Some have the, uh, the facility for flooding the cavity with termiticide, et cetera, 
So mm. except for those, but 70s, 80s and 90s, brick veneer buildings on concrete slabs, the slab edge is concealed. They're often in, in near trees or in a bushland area and termites can get through the brickwork through various means, whether it's a little break in the mortar or through a weep hole. Gardens are often built up against walls. Mm -hmm. Termites get in the weep holes and into the walls and, there's, and you can't tell from either outside or inside because they're subterranean. Um, whereas weatherboard buildings usually are built, they're elevated. And so are some brick veneer buildings. They're, they have a timber floor, so that's different. You can get underneath and you can look around. But uh, they're the most susceptible of all the, um, the brick veneer buildings on concrete slabs. So, for example, if you're having one of those inspected, it doesn't mean don't buy it. It just means yeah. be vigilant, have regular timber pest inspections, and also maybe install some bait systems or some bait stations. And there are other ways of monitoring for termites. And that's where your thermal imaging uh, camera comes in when uh, the inspector comes around because that can see through walls that the building inspector can't. And it it's almost can, like uh, an X-ray machine, isn't it? Yep, yeah, type of thing. Mm. Yeah. So, um, uh, but we, we, you're talking about weatherboards there, Veronica. No, um, really, it's just uh, um, fungal decay is the most common thing that affects uh, weatherboard buildings. But also the older ones, you find they get a bit saggy baggy. They'll um, they were usually built on <laughs> piers or um, mm. stumps. I think you call them up in Brisbane, maybe. I know they, they are, call them yep. stumps in Victoria, um, and they will often settle irregularly depending on the soil. Um, they were often not on a on a concrete pad or anything, and so the building works its way out of level a little bit and it'll, it'll be up and down and the floor will be a little bit out of level here and there. Sometimes the fireplace, if it's there, and it often isn't the older ones, because that's a big, heavy masonry element, it actually sinks down a little bit and everything follows down towards the fireplace a little bit. But it's not always, it's catastrophic. It's often just part of the character of the place, as you, as you said earlier. Seen some very wonky houses in I, my uh, time. I was once, yeah, <laughs> I walked through some houses and thought I feel seasick yeah, yeah, yeah. walking through walking this house. Downhill. Seasick. And the building inspector <laughs> once taught me to to take a golf ball or a ping pong ball. I think it was a golf ball because of the weight um, to inspections and just roll it gently along the hallway and mm. see which direction it travels. And if it takes a re veers really quickly, you know which direction, you know which stump might have sunk. <laughs> That's um, right. And you know th these yeah. are things that can be remedied, can't they? You know, you don't walk away just of because course. you find these things but it's always no, 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 wide open and how much yeah. does it cost to fix yeah well that's the point i mean when you you're buying a house the inspector will come up with look you're paying him to tell you what's wrong with something so it's almost always a, a negative document that you're getting and mm. and by the way don't it can be just scary, read the can't document. It, that document well don't just yeah. read the document without talking to the inspector because mm. the inspector has to cover him or herself in certain certain ways etc but it's good to read it be shocked and then talk to the inspector and say look how <laughs> really how serious is this is this something that i'll find in every other house that i inspect of this uh, that i look at at this age of this age you know and he, he or she may, may well say yeah look this is pretty common it's it's not horrific it can be fixed or don't bother fixing it it's just inherent uh, if you look at another house there'll be it might not have this particular defect but it will have others so yeah. you're just going in with your eyes as you said wide open that yeah. is such a good question. Is this something I'm going to find in every report, basically? Because people can get scared off the first one, think, oh, my God, you know, and maybe it is good to have a reality check about, you know, the things that can go wrong with the house. But, yeah, by understanding that, that you are going to cop this every time you get one of these inspections for this type of house, then, yeah. then you're going to be less freaked out by that particular one. Yeah. The, other, the other thing with weatherboard, I know that, um, you know, one of the, you may have told me this actually, that when you've got problems with weatherboard, they're actually a lot cheaper to fix than they are in a brick house. So if you've got rising damp, it's, it's a lot more expensive to rectify well, them. Replacing well, you won't board. have, well, the thing is you probably won't have rising damp mm. in a weatherboard house. That mm, won't happen. Much less common. Yeah. Um, and if you want to change things, it's a lot easier. You can just cut a hole, cut, use a saw, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot simpler than dealing with, <laughs> with, yeah, a lot simpler than dealing with brick. So easier mm. fix. Um, and yeah, pretty good. They're pretty good. I, I like weatherboard houses, people shy away. From, and there was a time I remember years ago when, when I was much younger that there was a kind of stigma about anything but brick. But I think <laughs> now that's gone. I don't think that exists anymore. But there was a time when, you know, weatherboard and fibro and all that stuff was, um, something you avoided, but um, know, certainly no reason nose. to. Mm. We'll, we'll get on to fibro and asbestos, I'm sure. Yeah, um, yeah that's a different subject altogether. Yeah, 
but earlier, yeah. Veronica, you, you, you talked about um, whether people should get a building inspection. And, and you know that after they've missed out on three or four houses and, mm. they've, and they've had paid for four inspections, they get sick of it and they're tempted not to do that. Yes. But these days, I think you probably also know and will agree that um, a lot of agents will organise for an inspection to be done or the vendor will arrange for an inspection to be done and then that becomes available to the, the buyer and, and then that buyer has the benefit of looking at that and they only pay for it or they pay a small amount but they pay the full amount if they are the successful buyer. You know, so there is that benefit these days. It's more and more common. And, in fact, I think it's, uh, uh, agents are legally obliged to let you know if you're a buyer that an, ins an inspection's been carried out and the report's available for you to buy. That's yeah, a New absolutely. South Wales thing, yep. Oh, yep. Mm. Certainly yep. not in, in New other South states. Wales, at least, yeah. is that right? Yeah. 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 Mm. So with that, and that's a good, good thing that you brought up there, Peter, because yeah. I know back in the day when I used to engage you to do inspections, you know, we all had to get our own one. No agents would do it, and, yeah. and that's sort of a fairly, fairly recent thing. But the problem is, of course, that when you commoditize a service, then you are going to get, um, you know, you're going to get a sort of a base level of service, right? And also there's that argument that potentially the vendors and the agent are a bit biased towards having a really light. Oh, yeah, yeah. Report. I agree. I would, I would always get my own inspector myself. Yeah. So yeah. If, if, though, time sometimes is of the essence and you, you access that report, how do you, and obviously you can't talk to the inspector unless you pay for it. Uh, we know that in our business and we, we if we do mm. end up, you know, looking at one of those reports and, and wanting to to buy on the strength of that, then we need to make further inquiry. But what sort of questions specifically should a buyer be asking of those inspectors? Because they're going to, you know, it's more of a mass produced service, right? So it's a little bit different. It is. And, and often these, I've read some of these more modern reports and it's very generalised, it's very generic, it's, it, it, doesn't seem too personalised to that particular building. So, look, it, for example, if it's a, we talked about brick and weatherboard, if it's a brick building and it might be a, a brick building from the 19, late 19, uh, the late 1800, sorry, we're, we're in a different century now, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it might be a, a Victorian building, like a typical terrace. It might be in Paddington or Balmain or somewhere like that, or um, I'm, I'm sure there are terraces in Brisbane. To be honest, I've never I've never been to Brisbane. Not as many. Not as many. Not as many. A lot um, in Melbourne. There's a lot yeah, in Melbourne. Yes. Well, mm. those buildings are, are they're solid masonry. They're built without the benefit of a cavity. They don't have cavity walls. They have solid walls. Now that's good. They're strong, but that means that damp, the cavity is there to stop dampness going from one side of the wall to the other. So if you're looking at a, a terrace house, um, a, a Victorian building doesn't have to be two-story, a little single-story terrace. Anything built prior to around very early 1900, um, which is Federation period, then you'll, you'll ask, be asking your inspector to check for dampness mm. probably before anything else, dampness and structural movement. Um, dampness can happen in those sort of buildings, not only as rising damp but as, as penetrating lateral damp uh, because they rely, relying, they rely on the paint on the outside of the building to mm -hmm. stop that dampness coming through. So, so... Da on those buildings, Victorian buildings, Victorian brick buildings, um, dampness and structural movement. Um, so he's looking for cracks, he's looking for rotation of walls, which means that walls are, are settled out of level. And sometimes that's quite minor. And you'd expect, I'd be very surprised if you if you found a Victorian building that doesn't have some dampness or some movement. But it's the serious stuff you're looking for. Yeah, um, because in, they were built with like, Slate, wasn't it? Was it slate that was sort the damp of a layer course of... was often slate in in Victorian mm. buildings. Yep, and then a little bit later on in early uh, Federation times, they used the bituminous um, a bituminous damp course, which by now has pretty much broken down. But mm. because Federation buildings and then later the California bungalows etc. have cavities, you 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 don't have the same issues as you do with the Victorian buildings. You do get dampness, you do get rising damp because of that breakdown in the um, in the damp course, but not as badly as seen Victorian buildings, but it's certainly there. And then in the 40s, the late 40s, I started using lead as damp course, and then that also deteriorates over time to some extent. Mm. So the damp course fails. And what can happen is if dampness will come up in one spot and then travel laterally along the damp course, but above it, and then present as rising damp inside the house. And you've got, of course, um, bathroom leaks, which is very common in you know, buildings that don't have renovated bathrooms. Mm. I mean, modern bathrooms use, use modern um, waterproofing systems, you know, but um, that's the other thing your building inspector should be checking and you should be asking about. 
Realistically, I, the, the, the naked eye from an untrained person is not going to detect something like that. They're, they're, they're really not going to be able to see if there's rising damp unless there's significant amounts of mould inside the property, really, are they? Or bubbling. Yeah, sometimes it's a real yeah, specialist it's area to have someone yeah. look at. Well, sometimes it's visible, but other times, especially if it's really bad, I've seen it sort of painted over for the... Mm you know, for the selling campaign, mm-hmm. and um, that will conceal it for a little while. Um, but your building inspector will put his moisture meter on that. He'll check it, mm-hmm. you know. And also he'll be armed with the knowledge that going into the building, knowing its age, knowing its type, looking at the topography, he'll say, ah, oh, good chance of damp here because, you know, we're on the low side of the street, whatever. It can yeah. be all sorts of things like that that you might not think about when you go, when you go in to look at the building. So you know, why is it a problem? I mean, it sort yeah. of seems obvious, but to, to point out, well, I guess, for us, what can happen if you if, if damp is left if it's undetected? If it's really mm. bad, it's mm. bad. Well, it's bad for your health, but the health of the building as well. So mm. the dampness can can cause um, you know mortar to break down, um, that sort of thing. Usually, it, it, it's not a critical problem in terms of the structure, but it's it's really a health issue for you. So. If, if you, have, you suffer from asthma or, or, or whatever, you've got dampness, you've got mould spores that, well, m- not so much mould, but that, you know, that um, the silicates and calcium and all that stuff that leaches out of the bricks, it sits mm. on the surface. Um, and, you know, it's increasing the, the humidity in the room, basically. So that's not good for you. An interesting thing about dampness that comes through um, brick walls is that, the mould thing is usually to do with condensation. It's not so much because of the dampness that is either rising or penetrating because when dampness comes through brickwork and masonry and mortar and all of that, it leaches, um, it becomes contaminated and, um, you know, products from inside that, that, brick, that brick and mortar, you know, silicates and all that stuff get leached out. And, and uh, mould loves fresh water. So with condensation... Right. When it condenses on a wall, you know, you've got, air, you've got moisture in the air, you've got vapour, it hits the wall, the wall is cold, it, it becomes water again and then dribbles down the wall pretty subtly or down the glass of the window or whatever. Mould loves that because it's fresh water. So when you see mould, it's usually more to do, although it does, look, you know, nothing's an exact science, you do get some mould growing on around, in and around rising, penetrating damp, but mostly it's because of condensation mm, and that's poor ventilation mm. and you might not, you, there might not be an exhaust fan in your shower or you might not switch it on. So you have a steamy shower, steam works its way around the house, finds a cold surface, condenses, becomes water uh, and there you go, you get mould. We've, uh, we, we manage a number of about 300 properties in, in Brisbane and we've had two properties that had quite a lot of mould in, in them. And what we learnt about that and what I learnt about that in talking to the specialists in that area and subsequent questions that I now ask building inspectors is, is quite important because mould's everywhere. I mean, it's, it just naturally occurs. It, it, yeah. It's how it, as you say, how it attaches itself to the building and what it does in terms of its growth and the, the factors that create the environment that allow it to thrive. Um, yeah. you know, we had a, a tenant who bought in a damp chair from outside, put it on carpet, and suddenly there was a mould problem in that mm. room yeah. um, because there wasn't a lot of natural ventilation. But um, you know, some of those sorts of questions I think are really good ones for buyers to ask in terms of ventilation and, and um, yeah. And, and making sure that you haven't got the kind of environment that's going to cause yeah. mould spores because that's not it's not good for anyone's health. Absolutely. Well, ventilation and you're talking about vent, you know, the roof ventilation, ventilation of the house, subfloor ventilation, all these things add to that problem. But if you ask a building inspector about mould itself, they probably will disclaim out of that. They'll tell you all about the ventilation, <laughs> but mould is not really part of a building inspection. It's a, it can be a medical issue. It can be an issue for a scientist. But most building consultants are not qualified to actually, you know, talk about the mould spores, the actual mould and what it can do to you physically because they're they're just not medically trained. But um, they can certainly talk about if you see mould, then the issue will be a condensation and ventilation. And so you can talk about those with your building inspector. Actually reminded me, Peter, this is a building that you inspected for a client of mine a long time ago and it was um, in Concord West and 
when I was there, it was tenanted and I and I happened to notice out the back there was like a shed or a garage and out there was like about four like room heaters. I mean, obviously we weren't looking in the middle of winter, otherwise it would have been in the house, but like four it was like yeah. it was such a lot of room heaters. So I just mentioned it to Peter. I said, look, don't know if it means anything, but that's just an odd number of room heaters. Mm. Um, so what do you think? And you came back to me and said, well, the, this building was built in the 50s, I think, and it was actually a single brick house, I think you told me, and all the inside windows were condensation, full of condensation the whole yeah. time. And, and I can't remember what the reason behind that, but it was obviously in the construction, this type of construction of the property that basically we didn't buy it for the client because it was like we, unless you actually build another, another exterior wall or something, you can't solve the yes. problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, look, I don't remember that specific one, but if I talked about single brick, it wouldn't mm. have probably been the whole house, but uh, uh, sometimes in the older places you'll get a section of it built in, at the rear, usually in single mm. brick construction, and obviously that's no good. There's too much dampness comes through that. But um, certainly I've, I've seen that and I've, you know, I've seen some illegal work that's been added onto houses where someone's built their own extension in single brick, no cavity, uh, nothing. So you see that. Yeah. Oh, look, I don't remember. That must have been a long time ago. Veronica, it because, was a long time ago. Yeah. But, and it was just fascinating. It was like, oh, my God, the things that if you don't yeah. know, you wouldn't know and you somebody would buy and I, Can I just I, clarify that because we don't have a lot of brick construction up here. So when mm. you're talking, Peter, about single brick construction without a cavity, can yeah. you talk to us about what that looks like? Because, you know, my my image of a house being built nowadays is there's, there's a brick, brick facing outside. There's a, a, uh, some um, tim, timber or um, steel that is the framework yep. inside That's that right. and then plasterboard that attaches to that. So is that what we're talking about or are you talking about That's something it. a bit And in the, in the middle of that, there's a cavity and there's some insulation these days and some reflective foil and all the rest of it. But uh, single brick is when um, you look, you can still actually you can still use single brick in some applications in some wet areas. So if it's a laundry, um, if it's a garage, um, you can have single brick construction, but you can't in a habitable area. Mm. So, um, so it's literally just brick. It's just a yeah, one single one it's, single it's, it's wall of brick. A brick wall that's one brick thick. Got it. And water <laughs> so can go straight through it. Thick and, as a brick. <laughs> yeah, thick as a brick. So, now, yeah. Peter, you told me once that that a brick when it comes out of the kiln has a capacity to absorb a liter of water. Yeah, and you've got a good memory. Look, oh, that I is, really stuff. She yeah. does have a good memory. <laughs> now, this is a, this is a a dry pressed clay brick, not a not say an extruded brick, and that's a, that's comes out of a machine, and it's it's a bit different in its makeup, and it's got lots of holes in it and what have you. But a solid dry pressed clay brick, which is my favourite kind of brick, is it can straight out of the kiln in in laboratory conditions can be made to absorb a litre of water. So you can imagine if a whole wall of those bricks absorbed a litre of water per brick, um, obviously the water would descend downwards by gravity so the top ones wouldn't be holding as much as the bottom. But imagine the extra load mm. and the extra and the water that's in that wall. That's that's why you have a cavity, mm. Mm. you know. To stop that getting to allow yeah. it. Yeah. Some, bricks, bricks. some yeah. bricks are slightly glazed and so, the you know, the glaze will shed some water. So we're talking in a lab in perfect conditions, but a slightly glazed brick, is that's not going to happen. Um, if there are eaves over the top of the wall, that'll prevent some water hitting the wall and all of that stuff. But it is amazing how much water you can squeeze into a single brick. <laughs> yes. yeah. So now the thing is about paint, you mentioned on, you know, Victorian terraces, for instance, um, uh, or Victorian semi-detached or even, you know, double front of Victorian yeah. homes, that they're, they're double brick, but there, there's no gap between the two bricks and so That's therefore it. water can go from the outside right through two bricks to the inside. Absolutely. Um, and so reliant on for, um, you know, for external lateral damp coming in from outside as opposed to through the ground, you're relying yep. on paint um, yep. or a render or whatever it is to protect. The, right? render, on, the render's quite damp. The render on the outside of those buildings was usually a cement render, but on the inside it's just a lime render. Mm. The reason it was cement was because it's not quite as porous and so it does give you some protection but that's what the, but the paint is the the ultimate film that stops the water coming through and so this comes down to maintenance doesn't it because and, and back to weatherboard as well paint mm. protects timber paint look maintenance is everything Feels you know like, um, yeah. and i'll tell you the other little thing that happens with victorian building, buildings you see beautiful terraces 
all beautifully painted and everything else, but the really high bit, you know how the wall in a Victorian terrace usually sticks up past the roof part? It's a mm. parapet that actually mm. protrudes yeah. up over the roof and there's a chimney there usually as well. And it's usually curved on the top. So yeah. there's a curved parapet and the curve is there to shed water. But often the painters will paint up to the bit you can see and then not paint the inside of that parapet or the very top part. Mm. And that's the most important part because water then that's will the just... You want to stop that's the bit you want to stop getting into. Exactly. So... The parapet should be painted and sealed. It's, that's more important than the actual side of the wall, you know, but because they're very <laughs> tall, it's often a, a part that gets uh, missed. And the, I guess that's, that leads to another question, Peter, which is, um, you know, there are limitations to building and pest inspections and, and they're not the be-all and end-all because there right. are certain areas that you can't actually physically get to, to to inspect. So there's always going to be a bit of risk in in buying a property as there is. You know, of course. Um, but it's understanding what those risks are yeah. and what access the implications is a, one might of the be. Biggest Access is one of the biggest, I mean, inspection access, one of the biggest problems for inspectors. I mean, they're not, mm. they don't have x-ray vision. They can only see what they can see. And they're not allowed to, you know, make holes in a building when they're inspecting <laughs> it or damage it. <laughs> or, you're not allowed to lift up carpet. You're not allowed to move furniture within reason. If it's a, a chair to get to a, fl you know, a floor hatch, sure. But you're not allowed to drag furniture around and all of that. So, yeah. you know, furniture can conceal problems. But if you can't sure get under can. the floor, the, anything could be happening down there. Um, uh, I once uh, managed to open a, a hatch that I found under the corner of a carpet. It was a house in Crystal Street, Petersham in Sydney. <laughs> and I, I lifted the floorboards <laughs> and it was chock I mean, it was full of water. I'm talking not just a bit of dampness. The place was like a lake. It was like Ooh. a foot of water in the, <laughs> oh, the entire yuck. subfloor. The subfloor was lower than the outside part. Mm. Stormwater was gathering inside the, the subfloor because the stormwater pipes weren't connected to anything. Yeah. And inside there, if I'd, if I'd gotten in there, I would have been probably knee deep in water. Ooh. So that can happen. It must so, have smelt. But it was you, a could you just smell by, that when you were no, in there? No. Funnily wow. enough, you, it, look, the damp courses were working. It had a bit of rising damp. But um, actually the client bought it. They, they just drained it. They loved the place. They, they weren't my good client because no, I'd never weren't. recommend Crystal no. Street. It's a busy road. <laughs> no, 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 I wouldn't either. But, um, but they bought it. They liked it. It was, I think the price was right. I think that, that's what it was about. But they had it drained. I mean, I think I might have even designed a little drainage system for them. And, um, you know, water went away and it was okay. But, that, but had I not looked in there, mm. they would, would have bought that. And at some time in the future, someone would have opened up the floor for some reason and there would have been a lake and I would yeah. have got a phone call. You know? Yes, yeah. yeah. That kind of raises a question or oh, a question. No, it raises questions to ask, Peter, and that is um, some things are deal breakers and some things aren't. And I guess yeah. it's having that understanding mm. or that relativity of what your findings are. So for yeah. those people, that wasn't a deal breaker because they could see there was a way around it, they mm. could fix the problem, it costs money, you were able to help them understand mm. what that cost yep. was. So their decision then with eyes wide open was, well, we can go ahead with this and do and get this problem solved. But there must be some things that you see that you just think this is an absolute showstopper. There's no way I'd allow my daughter to buy this property. Yeah, I had that building, <laughs> had that one that I was talking about being on a, in, in a situation where it, this one had a rear lane that was much lower. It actually then went out a little bit flat, then sloped quite significantly away to a lane, which meant that they could simply trench that right. and, and discharge that water. So gravity um, meant it would go it, in the exactly. right direction. Had that house been in, um, in, a, in a little valley, you know, then it would have been a deal breaker. If there's yeah. no way of, you know, obviously you, could, you can put a pump in there. You can put in a, a little sump and there's a pump in it and any water that gets in gets pumped out and all of that. But you'd rather not have to rely on, on a you know a solution a pump like that, might that. Break down. That, yeah that's right gravity's best and in um, but they use pumps in all the, in, in, in all the uh, strata buildings in the mm. parking areas they've got mm. pumps but they usually got uh, numerous pumps they've got at least two in smaller ones so that if one breaks down the other one works but um, deal breakers big movement I mean for example I, I rem remember a Victorian terrace building two story but the side wall had actually rotated meaning it had moved outwards at the uh. top by about 150 millimetres, wow. that's six inches. So to me, that was a deal breaker. If it was 30 millimetres, probably not, mm. you know, but you'd still be advising, look, um, there are ways of, of holding those two walls together. There are rods, there's ways of doing it. 
their engineer, engineering solutions. But in this case, the solution was to demolish the wall and rebuild it, right. which was huge, you know. So mm-hmm. that was a yep. deal breaker. So in some cases, movement, structural movement is a deal breaker. These are the big ones, structural movement, um, really bad termite damage um, with the presence of active termites, really bad chronic dampness that you know, no matter what you do, you're never really going to solve. Mm-hmm. Um, because what can happen, in, even if you, in a Victorian building, say, with no cavities, if you have a go to the expense of having a damp course installed, and that can be expensive, and sometimes you can't do it depending on the, the circumstances, you know, of where it is and if you can't get next door and all of this. But if you've got access and you can do the damp course, which is expensive, you can do it by injection or you can actually put a physical damp course in. But then you have the problem of penetrating dampness descending down the wall by gravity and then sitting on top of the damp course and presenting as rising damp again just because you've now put the damp courses in but the dampness Mm. has come from somewhere else. So Mm. if that's suspected, then that's a deal breaker. Um, It might be that a roof can be – a roof's important. That's the main thing about a house. It it shelters you. And so if you're buying, say, a a California bungalow with an original roof and you still see them, that roof is probably going to need replacing and that can be – a $25,000, $30,000 $30,000 job. So unless you've cost factored that in, um, it could be a deal breaker if you don't have the $30,000. But if you plan for it and then replace the roof, it's a great house now because it's protected again. Yeah, and I guess that's what it comes down to. There's certain things that we all know have to be replaced or or dealt with at some point in, in the ownership of a property. And it, all roofs at some point need replacing. And- Absolutely, then forever. Um, so, so it's, therefore, it's that's a you that's a, a routine thing, and it just means that you have to factor in the cost. Whereas the damp thing that can't be solved because that's a design problem, that's a totally different kettle of fish, right? Correct. Mm. Yeah, mm. absolutely correct. Um, some things are not solvable. You can look with dampness. Usually, you can reduce it. You can make it better. You could. You might make it. You might get it down to a point where you can live with it. You know, but um, but remember certain types of buildings will never not have some dampness. Victorian mm. buildings will have some dampness. But if you can live with it, a little bit of dampness is okay. And um, sometimes it might be, you know, a little bit here and there and you can improve the subfloor ventilation. You can do all sorts of things like that which will keep it to a manageable, happy level that it's not affecting the paint, it's not affecting your health, it's not affecting the building. It's there. Uh, you've created some really good subfloor ventilation so you live with it, you know. What about cracks? Because I know yeah. a, a, it's a real issue in Sydney where you've got a lot of clay soil and so yep. therefore in a drought, you know, prop buildings sort of move in one direction when there's rain sure. and move in another. So, so what sort of cracking should people be worried about versus right. is normal in terms of a living, sure. breathing building? Okay. Well, <laughs> it's true. In Sydney we've got some big areas of clay, clay basins, and it depends on when, what time, at what period or in what era they were developed. So, for example, in uh, Artarman is one that just comes to mind, a lot of clay. And most of the buildings there are Federation buildings and California bungalows. And a lot of those buildings don't have concrete footings. They were just built on brick footings. So they do what the soil does. And Mm -hmm. so the clay desiccates during a drought and the building wants to push downwards, but it pushes down, the load of it pushes down unevenly and the building cracks. So in Artarman, um, most most houses have cracks, um, but they're usually settlement cracks and, they, and they, they usually present as diagonal cracking that follows the brickwork, mm. you know, so you'll see a crack shape, mm. shaped like a zigzag. Like a zigzag. Mm. Yeah, um, and that's telling you that that wall's moving or the foundation's moving and if the crack is bigger at the, at the top than the bottom, it means the walls are moving outward so the out, outer parts of the buildings have settled. If it's the other way around, it's the opposite. The worrying crack, I guess, is that is the vertical crack or almost vertical crack that you'll see going straight down a wall and it's quite big at one end or the other. That that usually indicates something more than just settlement. Now, the, the, years ago there was a, an indicator for cracking. I think it was put out by um, New South Wales CS- University um, building. I think I've seen a CSIRO from, one too. Was it? Yeah, and it, it yeah. described cracking... Uh, as slight if it was less than five millimetres. Mm. In it, we're talking in normal domestic brick building, mm. right? Um, so less than five millimetres, it's slight. Five to 15, it's moderate. And then 
anything after that you should have inspected by an engineer. So, you know, 15 mil, it's quite it's a big. It's, you could put your, you know, I'm yeah. looking at my fingers. <laughs> I could put my, I don't want to put tall man up to show you, but it's about tall man size. I'd be um, worried about that personally if I was even yeah. five mil. I'd be going, oh, I want to get that looked at. <laughs> that's it. That's it. So, but that's about as far as you'd go without having it inspected by an engineer. And what will happen? But there I've got to good... say, I'd be having that inspected by an engineer. Sorry. Of course. <laughs> you you would. Yeah. They would. That might but be the are, guidelines, but woo <laughs> There are ways of stabilising buildings. There are ways of repairing cracking. But what a building inspector should warn their client is that even if it's a smallish crack, if it's a settlement crack, once you repair it, and there are good ways of repairing cracks so mm. that this flexible filler and mm. um, these little these systems of pins that, and, and all of that, which is too kind of techie to go into, mm. I guess. But you do all that, they may still reappear. So yeah. if you buy a house somewhere where there's clay, it could be our town and it could be the inner west of Sydney or Eastwood, and there are, and there are uh, settlement cracks that you can see and you repair them, in five or ten years' time they might show up again. And, it, and, you know, people sort of expect, expect it after a while and accept it and they, and they just live with it. And after a while, the cracks are invisible. You know, they, mm. they, you stop noticing. Stop noticing. I hate well, it. They... I mean, I, I, this, but if you, if you told a client not to buy a house because it had some cracking, then there wouldn't be too many houses, brick houses <laughs> no. that weren't new, new builds, you know. But, newer but buildings, even they, they crack pretty quickly too. They will, but for different reasons yeah. usually. So mm. you'll see a crack in a new apartment block or whatever, and that can be brought about by differential movement. So that if there's a house or an apartment built on a concrete slab and it's brick, bricks grow. We know this, bricks grow and concrete shrinks. And mm. so there's a little contest between those two elements. And so you get a, a kind of a, this kind of pressure, uh, a lateral kind of pressure, and that's called lateral cracking and sometimes crazes. So that's happening for a different reason. Sometimes you'll get vertical cracks right down the, the, the corner of a block of apartments. You'll see a mm. little vertical crack, one brick in or half a brick in. And that's because of brick growth. The bricks have grown and they've put pressure on the corners of the building. And um, that usually isn't, that's not critical. It just looks horrible, you know. Yeah. And sometimes you'll have corroded lintels in a building. The steel lintels will corrode and they'll lift the brickwork above them. And that'll present as a horizontal crack at the top of, windows and it's really the rusted lintel that's pushing the brickwork up. Mm. So, you know, um, that can be, look, it's probably not a deal breaker, but that can be a costly repair. But once it's done, it's pretty much forever. Um, but the big vertical crack, any kind of rotation of walls that is significant and by significant to me is if you, you can notice it. I mean, mm. if a building inspector can notice it, then it's significant, you know. No, some people but, don't notice it. I mean, the person that was looking at this house that I, I told you earlier, it was a real house. Um, it was in Leichhardt where one wall had rotated outwards um, 150 millimetres. They hadn't noticed it. But when I stood out the front and pointed it, they couldn't believe they hadn't noticed it. You know? Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because <laughs> they, oh, they it's amazing love... when your consciousness is raised, how easily it, you can yes. see things. Yes. I was going for a walk the other night um, in Camperdown, Sydney, and I looked at this building and it's sort of like this, you know, red and white tape and and uh, like a barricade set up. It's right on the corner of a little lane. And um, and I looked up at the parapet and you could just see very, very clearly that the top corner of it is twisting and, mm. like, you just see it looks precariously sort yes. of hanging on top of this building. And I'm like, anyone walking down that lane at night won't see the tape, won't see the barricade. It's got this little notice stuck on there saying, oh, be careful of the <laughs> Yes, be careful of the para Oh, my <laughs> God, you know, like this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, it's it's all around us. <laughs> yeah. It is. And but certainly look, in Queensland I... we find timber buildings. Peter, you've probably seen this, those yeah. timber and tin buildings that we've got, tin roofs, timber walls, timber linings, yeah. uh, timber floors on either concrete or steel stumps. Yeah. Um when we get the, the August winds in, in Brisbane, your entire house can open up. You can have all the cornices that are opened up, all of the VJ wow. boards have opened up, everything's yep. opened up while everything's moving and that's what mm. these houses are designed to do. Yep. And then the winds stop and everything closes up again and you think, what it was? <laughs> that can what happen. happened to this know, house? <laughs> but there's also the, the moisture. Once, in, in a wet season, the timber will take up more moisture and mm. it will expand a little bit. And this is how they make clink, clinker boats, I think. You know, they rely on that. Once the, the timber's wet, it expands and creates a seal. And when it dries out during a drought, it will shrink. 
and you'll get the little gaps as well. And that's ha- happens. To, you, you notice that more more in the floors oh, than anything else. Mm. Yeah. And it could be scary stuff looking at sort of sort of like gaps through floors, for instance, <laughs> if you don't realise what's caused and what's normal, what's to be expected. It's relative. Versus, versus yes. what's actually a, a proper building fault. Well, um, in, in modern buildings, you know, you have to insulate floors now. Mm. And so you, you wouldn't notice. Like you'd look down and you just see darkness because there's insulation under there. It was just a disconcerting. I had a, we, we lived in Haberfield. We had a, a, an old house there. It was an old weatherboard, actually. And you could see, I could see into the subfloor through various bits of the floorboards. It's pretty good. I feel breeze is Natural airflow. Yeah. I've, been in, I've been into warehouse conversions where you could actually literally look through one apartment to the one below Ooh. through the floors. So, oh, it's disconcerting. Yeah, oh, not real good about that one. one. The sound but, um, would travel quite readily, wouldn't it? Well, it oh, sounds, God, yeah. that actually segues, if I can use that, that <laughs> Oft used word to uh, fire safety because mm. I'd be very worried about the fire safety of something like that. Of course, but yeah. Fire safety and hazards that I mean, building inspectors will often um, disclaim out of that, but I used to always, um, you know, offer an opinion on safety of the building in terms of the fire safety, whether there were smoke alarms, whether the balustrades were of legal height, whether mm. there was non safety glass. Because often the old building, the 50s, the 60s, mm, the yeah. 70s, 80s, there'll be lots of low windows that don't have safety glass in them. And so toddlers could be charging around and just mm. crash through a glass pane. So there are lots of uh, ways you can fix that. You can replace the glass. You can put shadow resistant film. So there are hazards that, swimming pool hazards, uh, swimming pool fences. Um, th- those are the sort of hazards. I think to me the important ones are uh, falling hazards where you've got balustrades that, that should comply, uh, fire hazards, uh, swimming pool hazards, electrical hazards. Um, you know, you'll often I'll be in, or, or used to be in a subfloor, and I'd see some dodgy electrical connection. Uh, the, the there was no junction box, there was no protection, um, things like that. You know, um, now you should have a safety switch. A lot of the older installations don't have mm. RCDs or electrical mm. safety switches. Now they're required. You know, so um, um, hazards are something you should ask an inspector about as well. They may say, look. You know, informally, because I don't think they, you know, really you can't write down it's got this, this, this hazard because if for some reason he misses a hazard, <laughs> you can then say, you didn't tell me about that hazard and I put my foot in this hole in the backyard and broke my ankle. So, <laughs> but you could ask generally about um, are there any obvious hazards. You know? And I think that's that's is a bit of a problem, isn't it? Because you know I'm often saying that you know those building inspection reports are pretty thick, and most of it is disclaimers. And you know you got to get to the meat of it. You got to get to yes. the stuff that's really useful and valuable for you to a decide whether to buy the property, and b yep. once you have bought it, to know what your maintenance schedule is going to be like. What are the important things to tackle, uh, and what what you need to do to look after the building? Because you know when you come to sell it down the track, you don't want to be the one who suddenly doing the lipstick on a pig, suddenly, suddenly yes. trying to ta- paint over the damp. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, you're right. That's been fantastic, oh, Peter. That's been amazing, Peter. Such good that's information good. For, for home buyers. And, and um, I think that, you know, it's one of the parts of my job that I really enjoy is, is actually walking around and listening to building inspectors and asking them, you know, how would you fix that? Can you fix that? What sort of thing, you know, how much would that cost? Um, is it a deal breaker? But my absolute favourite question that I always ask a building inspector is, would you allow your 20-year-old daughter to buy this property? <laughs> yep. and, and that's never going to be in writing. Um, but it gives you a really for a building inspector to have to make that decision. Yes. It, it it really is an honest answer. No, that's a great a great question to put I to your building really inspector. Like Absolutely, it for a building inspector. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now ask well, a lot of questions. That's the trick. Talk to your building consultant and ask as many questions as you like. Usually, they're very happy to chat. Yeah. Just like a lot you of knowledge always were with me when I was asking all my questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Peter. Again, I really appreciate you coming out all. of semi-retirement. I know that you do still yeah. help people, um, you know, yeah. uh, when they reach out to you. But so yes. I really appreciate you coming and sharing all these wisdom and experience and stories for our listeners. My very great pleasure. Lovely to have you on. In this episode, we've covered a very small part of our 10-step online course for first-time buyers. If you would like to learn more about the process and how to buy without making a mistake, then head over to our website, www.homebuyeracademy.com.au. 
Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss an episode. And if you like what you've heard today, please give us an iTunes review. Five stars would be wonderful. It will help others find us as well. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found this really useful. And if you have, please share the love with others who you know are in the same boat. We'll be back next week with some more priceless stuff. Thank you.